There's not really a nice way to put it, but growing up at school, I, I was a loser. I didn't have many friends, and the friends which I did have, when I would invite them over to, to my family's home for a meal, my father would pray in front of them and say, we're just going to give thanks for the food. And being the only kid from a church home, being the only kid from a Christian family, that was absolute torture the next day at school. I remember one day, uh, the kids at school, they, they glued my chair. I was bullied. I was bullied for the way I looked. I was bullied for being different. I was even bullied at church. Now you know you're going to be a failure in life when you're bullied at church. And so growing up I was very insecure. I struggled a lot and I wanted to fit in. I remember because we weren't allowed to listen to secular music, to non-Christian music, I used to go on Google. We used to have one of those, uh, do you remember those Windows 98 computers, those old box computers? Some of you have got no idea what I'm talking about but they were like spaceships. They were crazy. Well, I remember I remember going on Google there and I would have a piece of paper and I'd write down what was in the charts like Britney Spears or Papa Roach or, or Puddle of Mud and I'd write down the, the names of these artists and the songs and then I'd fold it up and put it in my pocket and then at lunchtime or at break time I'd go out onto the yard, onto the schoolyard, go into a bush and I'd open out this piece of paper and I'd memorise it. Yes, okay, Britney Spears, hit me baby one more time and I'd memorise these songs and then I'd go into a group of school kids into my class mates and I'd say, oh, have you listened to that song, Papa Roach, Last Resort? Great song, isn't it? Great one to listen to. All the time I was trying to fit in. And then I started high school. Here I was, this, this insecure 11 year old boy and I was just so embarrassed of who I was. I was embarrassed of my Christian home, I was embarrassed of my background, so I overcompensated. I discovered if I became the class clown, if I made everyone laugh, if I back chatted to teachers, if I was cocky, if I pretended I was hard, if I got into fights, suddenly people began to like me. And I went to parties and I began to smoke weed, I began to smoke cannabis. I hated it at the time, I remember the first time I smoked cannabis. I got this terrible sensation that I was dying. I felt like there was a thousand hearts beating in my chest and I was terrified. But I carried on doing it because I didn't want to be left out. I didn't want to go back to that position where I was the loser with no friends. And everything was going okay. I had friends, I was popular, things were going okay. But then I ended up in hospital. At 16 years old, I was meant to receive my GCSE results, the exam results you receive at the end of school. And I was so excited, I was going to go there and I'd finish school and we're on to a new chapter of my life. But my mother received a phone call that morning that said, you need to bring your son Joe into hospital right now, urgently. Don't, don't leave it, you need to bring him in right now. My heart had been having these palpitations. Uh, when I was playing basketball or just literally just moved in a different direction, my heart would start to flutter. It would beat funny, it would beat very fast. So we didn't think much of it because a lot of young people, they have palpitations and apparently nine out of 10 palpitations are completely harmless. But anyway, they, they, they attached this ECG to me, this heart monitor to me and I wore it around for a couple of days and then we sent the recording off. The next day, the doctor doctor rang us up and said, no, you need to come in right away. We've listened to Joe's heart recording, we need to talk to you about it. So I went in and sat in the doctor's office and he looked at me with quite a stern face and said, we're very sorry to tell you this, but we believe you've got sudden death syndrome. Sudden death syndrome? Isn't that, that, that illness where footballers they'll be running or soccer players they'll be running on a pitch and then suddenly bang they hit the floor and they die. That's exactly what it is. And so the doctor said we can't let you go home. There's no way we're letting you go home. And they took me up to a ward called coronary care which had just six beds in it. And here I am at 16 years old looking around and seeing just old men who've had heart attacks and here I am surrounded by these people with heart problems and I was terrified and I began to cry. You know the kind of tears where you, you're crying so much that you can't breathe, that, that your face is like this big red blotchy mess. I was just crying so much and I remember that day, the nurse, she, she pulled the curtains around to give me some privacy and I just knew in my heart, I thought, this is from smoking cannabis. This is from doing those drugs that I shouldn't have done. I, I've wrecked my heart and now I'm going to die, that's it. That night, all kinds of thoughts were going through my head. But I do remember this one prayer that I cried out to God. I said, Lord God, if you save my life, if you don't let me die, I promise you, 
I promise you, Lord God, I'll become a Christian. I'll give my life to you. And God answered my prayer. It turns out that I, I didn't actually have sudden death syndrome. I had something called SVT. And basically my heart was mimicking that which someone who had sudden death syndrome. And when they sent my recording off to a specialist in Liverpool, he said, no, 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 it's not sudden death syndrome. And with a, a, an operation, a heart operation called ablation, they burnt away my extra pathway in my heart and it was correctable. And praise God, I'm standing here today, still alive with no problems with my heart. So I'm a Christian now, right? No, I didn't keep my side of the deal. Two years later, I'm again, I'm at another party. And again, I've been smoking cannabis. Again, I'm high. But I went down to the bottom of the garden and I did some immoral things, some wrong things. And don't get me wrong, I'd done these kind of things before. I had sinned like this before. But for some reason, the day after, the day after that, following, the weeks after, I just felt so unclean. I felt so disgusted with myself. I felt sick at the sin that I committed. And I remember having showers and just trying to scrub the sin off me, trying to get rid of the sin because I felt so guilty. And at that time, a lot of things were falling to pieces. I was wanting to be an actor and I tried to get into drama school. But it, it didn't work out. I'd literally got down from 9,000 people right down to the final 60 with just 30 places left. I was this close to getting in, but I didn't quite make it. And I remember sitting at the back of my church one Sunday and the former pastor, an older man called Pastor David White, came up to me and he said, where are you standing at the moment? He would always ask these sort of direct questions which would make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But he said, are you thinking about the Christian faith more, Joe? And I said, I am. I am actually. And he said, well, what's holding you back? Well, Pastor White, I want to be an actor. And there's no way I can be an actor and go into Hollywood with, with all these blasphemous things that they do, with, with all the kissing scenes, with, with all the swearing. That isn't the way of the Christian. And Pastor White said to me, yeah, but we need more born again Christians in the media. You could be the light that stands in all of that darkness. I don't think you've actually got an excuse there, Joe. And I went home that afternoon and thought, Do you know what, he's right. I got on my knees and I said, Lord God, I'm tired of running from you. I'm tired of living this life apart from you. I've been brought up in a Christian home with parents who've loved me, who've read the Bible with me night after night. I need to come to you. I I'm committing my life to you right now. And then, I don't know if I did become a Christian that day, but I went off to a Christian camp and at the camp I spoke to a, an open air preacher, a man who worked for the open air mission. And I said, I'm thinking of becoming an actor. And he said, no, you really shouldn't do that. That's not the way of the Christian. You shouldn't become an actor. But he said, what you should do instead is why not become a preacher? Why not become a street preacher? You see, the same gifts which you need in the theater, a strong voice, a, a way of presenting, well, you need that as a preacher. Maybe God's given you those gifts so you can be an open air preacher. And I thought that's very interesting. And that same week, there was two people who told me about this evangelist, a man called Vinnie Commons, who lives in Southport, Lancashire, which was just 40 minutes from where I live. And they said, you need to go and meet this guy. He works with youth. You could go to his youth club. So I got in touch with Vinnie. I met him and he invited me to the open airs. And I loved it. I loved chatting to people about God. I loved talking to people about the Christian faith. But I do believe that that was a very important part of my salvation. Because a couple of weeks into these open airs, I was standing there listening to another open air preacher, a guy called Frosty. <laughs> and Frosty was preaching and he did this hand gesture, which I'll never forget and I've used it ever since when I open air preach. He said, God poured out all of his wrath on Jesus for your sin. And suddenly, Eureka, there was a light bulb moment where I realized that God had to be angry at someone for my sin. God had to punish someone for my sin. And that person, that someone, was Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it like this, he is the propitiation for our sins. And not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And friends, my dear friends, that is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He absorbed God's wrath for all of my lies, for all of my pride, for all of my anger, for all of my abuse, substance abuse, all of it. Jesus Christ was punished there on that cross and he absorbed the wrath of God for my sin. But let me tell you something else, friends. He died there on that cross 
for your sin also. So if you call out to him, if you put your trust in him, he promises that he will protect you from God's wrath, give you eternal life, clothe you in the righteousness of God and give you a home in heaven for all of eternity. Would you like that? Well, there's all you have to do is come to him, bow the knee and say, I need you, Jesus. Save me. I leave behind all of these wasteful things that I've been living my life for and I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. I've done wrong. Save me. Would you do that today? Would you call out to Jesus today to save you? Wouldn't it be wonderful if this video that I'm filming it in this back office here in the beginning of June, imagine if this was the day you became a Christian. That would blow my brains out. That would make me so happy to know that. I was saved at 18 years old. How old were you when God saved you?